Are you ready for the word? What's next week? Oh. Well, so here's the deal. Like, usually, I know he's like, he's not a guest speaker because he was the pastor here for 27 years. But it's like, you could even ask him, and it's funny because it's common practice in church to not let people know always when there is a guest speaker because some people are like, my pastor's not going to be speaking. I'm going to take that week off. But we know there's no carnal people like that in this church, amen. So um, next week, and actually for the next two weeks, I will still be present here. I'm not going on vacation. Um, but my father is actually going to be presenting for two weeks, right? Or did that move to three yet? Okay, only two. Two weeks, he's going to be preaching on end times. With everything that's going on, how many of you might just be a little bit curious on how all of this is going to play out? It's crazy. But for believers, Jesus says, lift up your head, your salvation, your redemption draws near. And so this is a message of hope. It's not doom and gloom. It is doom and gloom if you're an unbeliever. So hopefully we'll uh, have mass baptisms after these, uh, these teachings because uh, there's only two different places that people are going to go. And that's not condemnation. That is keeping it real because that's what Jesus said. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, next week and then the following week is going to be teaching on the end is near. So um, I heard someone say it like this. If John, uh, if, and you can read it in uh, 1 John, if John says that we are living in the last days, then this is the last of the last days. We are so close. So um, you should be excited because we are going to a place where Jesus will wipe away every tear and there will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. We will live forever with the king. Amen. So that will be uh, for the next two weeks after this. So you know what? We might actually have a lot of people because someone wants, uh, maybe people want to have a break from me talking all the time. So, and it's okay if you amen that. I don't have any feelings whatsoever. Okay. So let's kind of, we've been in this series called um, Grace His Part faith our part and so i just kind of want to recap a little bit last week we talked about humility and um it was just really awesome uh, we actually had a lot of people go back for ministry and uh, i want to do my best to be able to follow up with people that went back there specifically to re re receive healing and things like that and um as those praise reports come out, I will try to do my due diligence to get those out, whether it's on the website or just simply announce them to you. I can tell you that I did get some praise reports back, and people that, uh, that had chronic pain or were in pain that morning um, said that it, it had lessened or it completely disappeared. So praise the Lord uh, for that. If you, yes, clap for the Lord because it's awesome. If you are visiting in with us, we are a church that believes in healing. We are a church that doesn't believe when Peter died, all of the gifts petered out. It is, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? Just because we have the written word doesn't mean that that's all, that's all we need and we don't need miracle signs and wonders anymore. Um, how many of you know that Jesus was the Word? So in a sense, he had all of the Word already inside of him because he was the Word. And Jesus needed to operate in miracles, signs, and wonders. If the Son of God needed that in order to draw people in, why wouldn't we? I need all the help I can get. And the Holy Spirit is called the Helper. Right? Amen. Okay, so... Just to kind of recap last week, how do, how we, we talked about this. How do I know that walking in humility is the key to maintaining faith or trust? And so we went to this scripture, which is John 5, 39 through 44. And then we talked about, go ahead and bring up the next one. Uh, this is with the Greek inserted. So if it doesn't read exactly like your Bible, it's with the Greek interpretation or excuse me, the Greek language inserted in. And this is what the scripture says. You think by diligently examining the scriptures, you achieve eternal life. But they speak of me, and eternal life lies in me. This is Jesus speaking. And I don't care about people's opinion of me. You don't have love for God and yourselves because you don't receive me in my Father's authority. However, if someone comes in their own authority, you receive them. 
Isn't that really interesting? Isn't that how it is today? If someone comes in their own authority, football star, basketball star, pop star, movie star, we're just like, wow. We actually print magazines because we actually care about what some Hollywood star thinks about politics today. It's okay to laugh. I'm saying that facetiously. If you care what some Hollywood star thinks about politics today, um, I, I have lots of counseling sessions next week I can schedule with you. We don't care what people think about what's going on in politics. We don't care what other people think about what's going on, what, what their view of God is. Amen? Their opinion is no more important than your opinion. And the bottom line is, opinions don't really matter either. It is either truth or it is a lie. Amen? You know, we might have opinions in the sense like, you know, this Cinnabon cheesecake is the best dessert on the planet. And that is my opinion, and that carries no more weight as me as a pastor of the church than if you think carrot cake is the greatest dessert on the planet, okay? They're just opinions. But when it comes to certain things, there are truth and there are lies. It's just what's going on in culture today. Well, I know I'm, I'm born a male, but I think I'm a girl. Well, who cares what you think? You are born a male. You are a male. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so there are certain things that are just the way they are. You know, people are like, well, I really feel this way. I'm like, well, facts and statistics say this. I know, but I just don't feel like that's true. Who cares how you feel? That seems really harsh, but sometimes we just need to say it because feelings, when combined with truth, don't matter. Amen? Do you think that your feelings or my feelings or anybody's feelings trump truth? No. No. And that's the problem that we are in in society today is that our opinions, our, our feelings, and all of this are actually removing truth out of the world. So he says, if someone comes in their own authority, you receive them. Now, here was the key part that we highlighted how we know that humility is the key to faith. How are you able to believe when you are concerned with the opinions of others, but could care less about the one and only God and his opinion of you. Now, we did follow that statement up. Whenever you see the word glory, if we're like the glory of the Lord, it's the Greek word opinion. And that seems very strange, but that's what it is. But it says, there's a, there's a parenthetical note in there that says, in the New Testament, it's always positive. So if it talks about the glory of the Lord, it's talking about the good opinion of God. If, if we say, man, we're here to magnify the Lord and glorify the Lord, it means you have a good opinion of him. You think he's awesome. And so that's why we have the word opinion in there. But any time in your text, you're probably seeing the word glory or praise. But in the Greek, it's the word opinion. So Jesus is asking the question because we talked about how many times unbelief counters your faith. It's like um, if you had two horses that uh, had, um, one was pulling this way and one was pulling this way, and they had ropes tied to a boulder. If they're both pulling opposite directions, that boulder's not going to move. And so one is the horse of faith, one is the horse of doubt or unbelief, and they pull against each other. So what we had talked about last week is overcoming doubt. Well, how do we do that? Jesus says, how are you able to believe when you are concerned with the opinions of others, but not with the opinions of God. And here's the thing. God thinks you're awesome. He really does. Because he doesn't see you and what you do. He sees Jesus all over you because Jesus took all of your bad and gave you all of his good. So it's not that Jesus is saying God has good opinion and bad opinion. He's saying, why aren't you concerned with pleasing God? Why aren't you concerned with receiving the grace that he has and glorifying God? You are more concerned of what people think of you than God's opinion of you. Does this make sense? So what he's saying is that pride, which is man-pleasing, that's one aspect of it, he's saying, you're not able to believe because you're more concerned with this realm, this dimension, pleasing people than you are serving and pleasing the one true God. 
So that was the question that we answered, is that humility is the key to faith, to keeping faith, and to not move into doubt and unbelief. So then this brings us up to another question. How do I stay humble? We're, we're like going backwards in the dominoes. How do I stay humble in order to walk in a mature faith without doubt? And so we'll give you the answer and then explain it. So here it is. Staying conscious of God's favor. The key to staying humble is to stay consciously aware of God's favor in your life. And the scripture that we're going to unpack today is very short. But there's so much meat in there, and it is so contrary to what this world teaches us in regards to perception and in regards to circumstances. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your devices, if you have your app, you can go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Now when we go through this, you've probably read this many times or heard this quoted before. But as is a habit of mine, I'm going to unpack this in the Greek because your New Testament was written in Greek, and it's a very exacting language. You can go back to the first one. I'm sorry. Okay, so 1 Thessalonians 5.16 reads in this way. Always rejoice. I actually looked up the word always in the Greek. Do you know what it says? Always. I, I, I bring that to your attention because we could full stop right there and I could teach the whole time on this. Because all right now, maybe some of you, the wheels are turning and going, wait a second, there's been circumstances in my life that it would be bizarre, almost hurtful to me to rejoice in. But this does not say sometimes rejoice. It says always. Always rejoice. Never stop praying. Most of your Bibles say pray without ceasing. That means, you know, ceased means stop. So a better way to say it is never stop praying. Now, you are not all in sin right now because you're not praying. But the point is what it's saying is, and, and, and I will get to this later, is stay in constant communication with God. Constantly. That's all praying is. Communication with the Father. In everything, give thanks. I looked up the word everything. You know what it said? Everything. And not in some things, not in a few things, in everything. These are very specific words. Everything and always. I want you to walk away from this today remembering that. Because this world... This brain is going to mess with you in this area. So always rejoice, never stop praying, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will. Everybody say God's will. God's will, right? This isn't a nice suggestion on how to stay positive in this negative world. It's His will. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We're highlighting that because if you remember, uh, this was, I think, last month sometime, we, we saw how many times the word in Christ is mentioned. We are seated in Christ in heavenly places, right? Even though we physically exist here, the Bible clearly says in the present tense, we are seated in Christ or with Christ in heavenly places. It's the idea of being in Christ. God loved you in Christ before the foundation of the universe. Because we're like, well, how could that be possible because I didn't exist yet? No, in Christ, he loved you before the foundation of the world. And if you go through and read in the New Testament, you'll see how many times that phrase, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. In Christ, we have all blessings. In Christ, we have all favor. In Christ, and then so on and so forth. 
So this is God's will for you in Christ. Basically saying the idea that you could rejoice always, pray constantly, and in all things give thanks is actually not possible outside of Christ. All right. So here again is like, I, I went through, looked at the Greek, took things apart, and inserted words. So this is what this is saying, and there's so much meat here. At all times, experience God's grace and favor through making yourself consciously aware of it with gladness. When it says rejoice always, the root word of that is joy. And, you know, when we talked about the gifts, love is mentioned first, or excuse me, the fruit of the Spirit. Love is mentioned first, and then joy. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and meekness. Or, excuse me, gentleness and self-control. Joy is mentioned second. It's, it's the root word of this Greek word, and we had talked about joy means being aware of God's grace. Because, again, some of you are like, man, I had a really bad day. If you're telling me I had to have joy, there is no way anybody could have had joy in this situation. And I'm saying in the natural, I 100% agree with you. But in the supernatural, I 100% disagree with you. And it's not me disagreeing with you. Remember, it's not like, well, I feel this way or you felt that way in the moment. And it's not a denial of feelings, but it says rejoice. How often? Always. So at all times, experience God's grace and favor through making yourself consciously aware of it with gladness. So d does God's grace and favor on your life ever stop? Never. But does it always feel like his grace and favor is on you all the time? No. So we're really faced with two things. Either God is wrong or your feelings are wrong. How many of you would like to think that your feelings are wrong? Yes, you should put your hand up because um, you need to spend a lot of prayer time with the Lord if you think he's wrong. So it can only be one of two things. So what, it, what is the problem? We've always talked about this. The battle is your mind. I can't tell you how many great teachers in the body of Christ have talked about um, the battle is in your mind. Joyce Meyer made a huge series on it, the battlefield of the mind. And the bottom line is, that's completely true with Scripture. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? Renewing of your mind. Or we talked about the renovation of your mind. Get the old out, put the new in. So, if you do not always feel or not always aware of God's grace... You need to actively force yourself to be conscious of it. We do that with other things. You, if you're getting ready for a vacation or if you're getting ready to, um, you know, a, a work project or anything like that, what do you do? People talk about you psych yourself into it, right? Well, what is that really saying? You're mentally preparing for it. Well, if you're getting ready for a vacation, there's a lot of prep work done, right? I need to pack this, I need to do this. Your mind is engaged in it. My wife has a lot of extra work as a teacher now because Yorkville is one of the few schools that has three different uh, programs where they can either go full face-to-face, -face, part face-to-face, -face, or all remote. So she has some extra work that she brings home. And there's times where she'll be in there and she'll be working, and, and I'm just like, I love you. And she's like, I love you too. And I'm like, hey, what are we going to do tonight? I don't know. And normally I might be really offended by that. But she says, I'm sorry, hon, I'm in work mode. Now, what does that mean? That her mind is positioned into this. It's not that she doesn't love me or she's not being compassionate and, and to, to, to meeting my needs because, you know, us husbands have to have our needs met all the time. And all the women said. But, but, but when she says that, I just know, okay, not right now. 
And, and that's not, it's not a bad thing that she's in work mode, but that's where her mind is. And if I want to spend time with her, I want her spirit, soul, and body. Okay, we're three parts, spirit, soul, and body. I don't like to connect with people on some kind of just, you know, bodily level. Like, you ever had that conversation with somebody, you're talking to them, and you can just tell they're somewhere else. Like, they're, they're physically present, but their mind is somewhere else. And that's all this is. It's saying you. It's not saying, oh, God, supernaturally, and pour forth your spirit over me so that I'm just consciously aware of your grace all the time. You know how many times in the Bible that there is a command for you to do something? We think it's just all God's sovereignty that God, you know, I just wish I could experience more peace in my life. God, give me more peace. You think God is holding out on you? You think he gave you a son? And he's like, but I'm not giving you peace. Peace is more important to me than my son. Oh, Lord, I just wish I had more joy in my life. Will you give me more joy? No, I'm sorry. I'm reserving that for other people. Here's the deal. If the Bible says, if he who did not spare his only son, but freely gave him up for us all, how will he not also through him, or in Christ, freely give us all things. And I looked that word up too in the Greek also. Do you know what all means in the Greek? All. But see, what is the problem with all of these things that we hear is it does not necessarily come to pass in our lives because we don't believe it. And that's not a condemning statement. There's things that I don't receive in my life because I'm just not there yet. And it's my fault. And I'm good with that. You can ask my family at home. I, I am not boasting of myself, but I've just come to learn that there is a place, especially for the husband, that when someone's like, why did you do this? I'm like, I don't know. It was my fault. I messed up. I'm sorry. Because that stops the conversation. But if I start defending myself, well, you know, if you wouldn't have da 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 da, da or if the kids wouldn't have, it's just going to go on and on and on, and there's going to be more resentment. Better just to admit fault and move on. So it's in the same way with this. Don't get upset that you might actually have to see that there's some areas of doubt in your life or some areas of unbelief in your life. Better, just admit it like the man who had the demon-possessed boy and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. He admitted that he had unbelief. So God is not holding out on you. And, and even though this teaching is very subtle in the body of Christ that we just, oh, God, I need more grace. Oh, God, I need more faith. Oh, God, I need more this. I need more this. I need more this. I need more this. Did you know that that is actually a, a slippery slope of a certain serpent? Because what did he say to Adam and Eve? Hey, did God tell you you couldn't eat of any of these trees? And Eve defends God. No, 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 no. He said, we could eat of all of these trees, just not that one. And Satan says, well, that's the important one. That's the one that makes you like God. And that's why God doesn't want you to eat. And what is he saying? God is holding out on you. And I'm telling you that demonic theology is actually rising in the body of Christ, that somehow God is holding out on you. That we must petition and beg God for things that he has already given us through his son. Grace, his part. Faith, our part. Perhaps we're not receiving because we just don't believe it. Or we have doubt. And we need to humble ourselves. And he will exalt us. So this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, Can we go back one slide? So, at all times, experience God's grace and favor through making yourself consciously aware of it with gladness. That is the long version with the Greek inserted of rejoice always. So, at all times, experience his grace and favor. You need to consciously make yourself aware of this. I'm under grace. Man, this is awesome. My sins are forgiven. The end is coming soon, and I will be in the arms of Jesus. Constantly you make yourself, and, and even in the midst where all of these things are coming crashing down around you in this world, God loves me so much. You're practicing his grace and favor. You know who is really good at this? John. John would humbly 
refer to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. You think Jesus didn't love Peter? You're like, I don't know if they were times. <laughs> Do you think that, here's a really good question. Do you think Jesus didn't love Judas? You think Jesus didn't love Thomas, who's like, I don't believe it. I don't believe any of you guys. I don't believe the women. Unless I see Jesus and I, I touch him, I'm not going to believe. Did Jesus show up and be like, doubting Thomas, fire from heaven. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. He's, he walked over and he said, touch me. Touch me here. Touch me here. Touch my side. And Thomas drops to his knees and says, my Lord and my God. You know, people think all the times like, well, you know, there's never really a specific verse where it says Jesus is God. I'm like, Thomas declared it and Jesus didn't rebuke him. Jesus was God. Do you think he didn't love Thomas? But John practiced the love of God. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. That would be like me if I'm like, I'm the pastor who Jesus loves. That does not mean he doesn't love all the other pastors and teachers and prophets and apostles and, and whatever other titles people have. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love the equippers of the saints. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love the saints. It doesn't mean anything. It means that I am constantly practicing the grace and favor of God, and I'm saying that, speaking it, and doing it so that my mind is consciously aware of the reality that already exists. The reality of his grace and favor on your life does not change because you don't believe it. But I guarantee you this, it will have an effect on its effect in this world. So up here, the second one is, where we talked about never stop praying, is be in constant communication with the Father without any time gaps whatsoever. That's just the Greek laid out. Now, again, I'm not saying, oh, let's all bust out into prayer right now. But what it's saying is you need to constantly be talking to God. I know maybe we did this more as kids, but I, I, would, I would guess that some of us still do it today. You ever find yourself talking to yourself? Like you're literally having a conversation with yourself. Um, but... You have to, like, go into the prayer room and have the strings that will make you cry. And the atmosphere has to just be right so that I can communicate with heaven. Do you think that that's how God wants you to communicate with him? Or, you know, I'm pretty sure that when Jesus was communicating with his father, it does say that he would retire to, like, a... Um, a remote area, and I'm pretty sure that's because he knows if he's anywhere else, people will be like, Jesus, can you heal me? Jesus, can you pray for me? Jesus, you know what I'm saying? So he retired to a remote area so he could be alone with his father. But how many of you know, especially with people that are working from home now, you have a lot of time with yourself that you could just be talking to the Lord. And it's actually interesting, if you actually remove a lot of your requests, some of us will run out of things to say. And that's not a good thing. Why can't we just talk to him? If we could have a conversation with ourselves, and we all admit that that's silly, why would we not talk to the Father, the King of glory, the King of the universe? He's not up there going, you know, I'm really busy right now. He loves to hear from his children. So be in constant communication with the Father without any time gaps whatsoever. Here's another one, the third one that says, in everything give thanks. In every season, situation, and circumstance, acknowledge God's grace and favor is working. So the first one where it's rejoice always, it's staying consciously aware of it and, and being glad about it. You know, and some people will go to you, how could you be glad in this situation? What's the matter with you? There's a psychology term for that. It's called you're in denial. 
And you're like, no, I am just so glad for God's grace in my life because I might really handle this poorly if I wasn't so conscious of his goodness towards me. And then the last one is the same thing. In every situation, circumstance, being, again, making yourself consciously aware, acknowledging God's grace and favor, and that it's working despite the circumstances of it appearing that it's not. Well, again, this sounds like denial. You're saying that it sounds like my circumstances are the opposite of faith. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. And you might as well just insert your other four senses in there. Because again, either God's right or your feelings are right. Now, there could be times that those things line up. How many of you ever just felt like you stood in the presence of the Lord and it brought you to tears? I would say that that is a time where your emotions are lining up with God. But I've also talked to people before that I've been in a church service with them and they're like, the, the Lord is not here. And I'm like, that's baloney. Because the Bible says that God, by his Holy Spirit, has come to live on the inside of me. Now, I understand the idea is sometimes his presence is more tangible in this realm with our feelings and that kind of stuff. But to make blanketed statements like this, walking in a church, well, you know, I'd go to church there, but the Spirit of the Lord is not here. You're wrong. Unless they're all pagans and not worshiping the Lord Jesus, you're wrong. Because your feelings are determining reality. Does this make sense? Either the Bible is true or your feelings are true. And again, sometimes they line up. But we always defer to the Word. I'm just telling you because I'm telling the generations that are coming up, and, I, and are, are, it's all about my feelings and how I feel and how I see this, and that's why truth is disappearing. It's a big problem. So in all of these things that just listed, now, now we can go to the next slide. In all of those things, all of those things that we listed, this is God's will for you in Christ. That means no matter what happens, you lose a job, you have the death of a loved one, and you just insert any tragedy in there. I, as Josh, am not telling you this. I'm telling you what the Lord says. Rejoice. Give thanks in this situation. I'm not saying rejoice that someone is dead if, if that's the tragedy. What I'm saying is rejoice in spite of the tragedy. Give thanks. If a tornado just ripped your house down to shreds and you're staring at the rubble, be like, praise the Lord, my family is safe. I was safe. We weren't there. We were safe in the basement, and we were safe somewhere else. And you know what? Praise the Lord. I'm going to trust you for another house. And I will not doubt in this area because provision is promised from you. And again, somebody's like, oh, are you okay? You lost everything. You lost your precious memories, this, this. It's okay crying my shoulder. No, I'm good. And then later they'd be like, Josh is in denial. Uh, we should confront him. Let's have him over for dinner and like, um, you know, like they do like for drug addicts and stuff. What do they call it? Intervention. <laughs> he's crazy. He lost everything and he's like smiling. It's okay. Because if we react the same way that the world reacts in these situations, why in the world are they going to want our Jesus? What does our Jesus have to offer if when we and them are faced with the same circumstances and we fall apart as easily as they do. This is not a suggestion for living. This is God's will for you in Christ. It's that simple. If this upsets you or offends you, um, I would go to the pray without ceasing part and take it up with him. Please don't come to me and talk to me about this. I literally read it for you right out of the Bible. If you'd like some clarification on that, I would be more than willing to oblige you. But this is God's will for you in Christ. So we're going to do something um, a little different.
I'm going to be the first to put my hand up so that anybody else who puts their hand up doesn't feel uncomfortable. How many believe that maybe we need to spend some serious time rejoicing in a certain situation that we might be going through and giving thanks? Again, not giving thanks for the situation, but in the situation, giving thanks. How many of us sometimes feel that when we go to the Lord, it's just about what I want instead of praising him for who he is? I've heard a lot of people say this, and I believe it to be true. 90 to 95 percent of your prayer time should be thanksgiving and rejoicing. Instead of focusing on the one thing that you feel that God maybe hasn't done in your life yet, why don't you focus on the tens of thousands of things that he has already done? Can you do this today? You could praise him for that, that you have air in your lungs. Because you know what? Some people do that with great difficulty. Do you have a roof over your head? Is your belly, when it grumbles and says, give me food, are you able to pretty easily put food into there, either because you have the monetary means or because you're physically able to swallow food and it nourishes you? And these seem like such small things, but without God, we would be able to do none of these things. So what I would like us to do and when I get done giving instruction, we're going to bring the keys up. And it may be awkward, but we're just going to be still. I'm going to be still. I'm not going to give any more instruction after this. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to start getting, whether it's pictures in your mind, lists in your mind of just things to be thankful for. Things in your life to rejoice over. It could be current. It could be past. Because we need to be staying conscious of God's favor. Because in many ways, we have become a complaining people. And you know what's interesting? We think of big sins as like adultery and murder and doing terrible things to children and all that. Do you know that one of the most frequently uh, sins that is listed is complaining and fault finding. In fact, do you know that in the Old Testament, because they complained against Moses, um, his uh, sister complained against him, and she got leprosy all over her face. A group of people created an uprising and complained that we need a different leader than Moses. God opened up the ground and swallowed them whole. They didn't murder anybody. They didn't fornicate with anybody. They complained. So that would be a good one to start with, being consciously aware of God's favor, that he will not open up the ground and swallow you whole. He will not smite you with leprosy because we are under a new and better covenant. Amen? But let's just be grateful and thankful and becoming a grateful and thankful, not just a people of God, but as a church, as, as, as a local body together. Let's just become a people of rejoicing and a people of thankfulness and gladness. And how are you going to do that? Stay consciously aware of his grace. So we're going to do this for about 10 minutes. And you know what? I guarantee you will not be uncomfortable if you stop thinking about you and close your eyes and think about him. But that is the assignment. I want you to start thinking of current situations, and I want you to begin to thank him. It's all right when I say we're going to be quiet if I start to hear some thank you, Lord Jesus, for this. I mean, if for some reason you feel that that like needs to come out and be shared, then fine, do that. Or you can do it silently to yourself. But let's move into an, a time of rejoicing and thankfulness. And as painful as this may be, I want you to maybe intentionally find a situation that in the natural is jaw-dropping. It's, it's, it's painful but I want you to begin to thank him 
surrounding that situation. Not thank him for the pain, not thank him for the situation, but be thankful in the midst of. Does this make sense? So I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna bring up the keys and we're just gonna move into this time of being thankful and rejoicing. Father, how could we not be a people of joy and thankfulness? We were destined for eternity of torment in hell. So at the very least, even though it is the very greatest gift, we should be grateful that we will spend eternity with you. But Holy Spirit, we ask that you bring to our remembrance situations that we may be currently dealing with, or maybe to bring to our remembrances a situation, a thorn, a wound that has never really healed from the past, a hurt that somebody did, a time where perhaps we thought that we trusted in you and felt like you let us down. And let's begin to open that wound up again and finally let it heal and seal for the first time ever so that it's not a scar. Like the woman who got healed instantaneously when she touched your garment, but then you said, go and be made whole. We may have healed in those areas, but there's a scar there that kind of opens up every once in a while. Holy Spirit, bring us to those things so that we can humble ourselves before you and be able to go into that situation and be thankful. To be joyful, not for it, but in the midst of it. Holy Spirit, guide this time as we, guide this, guide this time by grace as we by faith will begin to rejoice and be thankful. In Jesus' name, amen.